Well, good morning, church family. Let me invite you to stand to your feet this morning. My name is Matt Bonin, and we are so glad that you are here with us to celebrate a risen Savior, to be excited about what God is doing. You say, Matt, it's cold. That's okay. You know what? It's going to get colder, and that does not change the fact that God is still here, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person. Let's have a great morning this morning. You sing this out with Scott as she as he leads us this morning. Come on. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you, your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth, your love is where
we see that God has demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This amazing price that he paid so that we could have a relationship with him. So let's think of what that story looks like. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running you are here with us. My name is Matt Bonnet. I'm the executive pastor of operations and worship here at Eastside, and we are glad that you are with us in person. For those of you who are joining us online, we're thankful that you're there with us, with your families, or whomever you may be gathering with, whether it's a watch party or whatever. We're thankful that as a body of Christ, in a season that is very unique and different, we can still gather. How many of you are thankful for that ability? I'm going to tell you right now, as silly as it sounds, there are a lot of states that even can't do this because of restrictions this morning. And so when you look around this room, I want you to just take a quick look 
While you're sitting there at home, understand that there's about probably 150 people here. And it's really awesome to know that we can be here making much of Jesus. And so if today you're here for the first time, you say, Matt, I don't know anything about Eastside. Well, we want you to text the word welcome to the number that's on the screen. And what we would like to do is get some information into your hands, connect you with somebody who can know more about what this church is doing to reach this community with the hope of Jesus Christ. And so if you do that, whether you do it online or you're doing it here this morning in person, you don't have to fill out a card, it's a simple text message, and we'll be able to give a donation on, our, on your behalf to our missions partners, which we're gonna start to learn about today. We're gonna begin learning over the next five weeks some of our most primary missions focuses for the church. And so there's a lot of things that are going on that God is truly blessing. And as we continue in worship this morning, we're gonna enter into a season of giving. And so we can do that three different ways. You can give online, or you can give in person. We'll have some boxes at the back on your way out so we don't pass an offertory plate, or you can mail that gift in. And one of the things you can be certain of is as you give, God uses those things to further his kingdom and his gospel as we are stewards of it here at East Side. So if you say, Matt, what's going on here at East Side? Well, let's take a quick look at East Side Life. Hey there, I'm Jenna, and welcome to East Side Life. For those of you who might be new, Eastside is a church whose purpose is to transform Fort Smith and beyond. We exist to help people gather to worship Jesus, grow to follow Jesus, and go to share Jesus. Here's a quick look at what's going on just for you. This week, we begin our Missions Partners Focus, and we are kicking off with Kansas City and the partnership we share with Ray Peoples and New City Church to reach the lost in Kansas City. This week, we will be utilizing our Facebook page and website to post content about New City Church, how you can pray for the mission, and how you can become personally involved in the future of this church plant. Tune in to social media and our website for updated information throughout this week. Another area of missions partnership for Eastside is the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and Prayer Focus, which happens every year at Christmas. Next Sunday, we will dive into an eight-day prayer guide to call on God to move mightily among nations for His glory and for the furtherance of the gospel. At the end of this prayer focus, we will be receiving a special offering in December, which goes directly to international missions. Begin praying right now about how you can be involved in this special offering and join us next week in this season of prayer for international missions. This week, we celebrate Thanksgiving as a nation. The staff and pastors here at Eastside want to let you know how thankful we are to serve you, to love your families, to encourage your households, and to join you in disciple making. As you celebrate this week, reflect on the blessings God has placed in your life and give thanks. Well, that's a wrap for this week's Eastside Live. Next Sunday, November 29th, we will have a family worship Sunday. So all kids worship and preschool ministries will be suspended for that weekend and will return on December 6th. Register the whole crew online and join us for our main service as a family. Don't forget to stay connected on social media by following us at myeastside.tv. See you again right here next week. Have a great day. Well, hey guys, my name is Ray Peoples and I am a North American Mission Board church planner to the city of Kansas City. And one of the cool things about our relationship with Eastside is that three years ago when we moved to Kansas City, Eastside served as our sending church. And so we are excited to have our relationship with you and our partnership as we move forward and even the weeks and months and years ahead. So three years ago, my wife and I moved to Kansas City uh, with kind of a vision to uh, bring down the percentage of lostness in this city. Uh, when we first saw the stats of Kansas City, over two million people in the metropolitan area and only 40% proclaimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We saw a great need for a new church in the area. Well, let's fast forward now to where we are now, and here we are about to celebrate our third anniversary on Palm Sunday, and the Lord has actually moved us to a different part of the city. We're now in an area called KCK. We're in the southeast corner of KCK, and we're about 10 minutes from downtown Kansas City. And the unique thing about this community and this area is, number one, it's diversity, but number two, it's kind of a forgotten area of the city. 
And so we have found this awesome opportunity now that we've stepped into this older church that's been in the community since 1960. Uh, it had 12 people in the church and they actually voted to hand us their building and all of their assets in it. And so we had an awesome opportunity to now take this forgotten community and bring new life to this area. And in that, the Lord has just continued to bless us and has continued to bring people through our doors that we never thought would be coming through our doors. And what I mean by that is they would find us on Google and we, or we would ask, why are you here? Well, we found you on Google and you're the closest church. How cool is that, right? That's the time and the place that you understand you have nothing to do with it. It's all the Lord bringing these people to our church. And we are super excited as we are going into 2021. We have kind of a, a new vision as we've moved into this new space. And we kind of have a, ta a tagline for that. It's for the hill. And what we've learned is that this community right here around our church has been nicknamed the hill. And so we feel like God has put us here to be a gospel-centered, uh, disciple-making, church-planning church. And so we're looking forward to the opportunity to reach into this community and share and show Jesus as we are doing multiple things. On East Side, we just wanna say thank you for your support and your love for us over these past, um, now coming up on three years that we have been here in Kansas City. And we want you to understand and want you to know that this, where we are now, would not be possible without you without the folks who are praying for us, the folks who have supported us financially, and even the folks who have come on trips in the past and have helped us out in multiple ways, whether it be the block parties that we've done or even getting down on hands and knees and laying carpet in our new building. And we are so thankful for you and so thankful for you and what you mean to our family and what you have meant to our family for multiple years. And so we're so thankful for you and just the opportunity that you have given us to step into a calling that the Lord placed on our life. Well, let's just take a moment and pray for the, the peoples and New City Church, all right? Father, we thank you for this great work that you're doing in Kansas City. Thank you for Ray and Abby and for just their sensitivity to your uh, spirit's leadership and to your calling upon their lives to move from here to Kansas City and to make the gospel known as loudly as they can. And so, Father, we pray for their protection. We pray that you would meet their every need. Uh, Lord, as we all, all churches are in this unique season of how best to minister to people, how best to reach people and to make disciples. And so, Father, we just pray for just a supernatural abundance of wisdom and discernment upon uh, the peoples and New City Church and their leadership. We pray the same for our church as well and for all of our churches in this community and abroad. And so, Father, I just thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us to partner with them, and we pray your blessing upon them and that we could be a blessing to them as we know that they're a blessing to us. And, Father, I pray for, for Eastside. I pray for the people here, those watching online. Father, I pray that you would give them an incredible week of thanksgiving, Father, an incredible time of family. I know it's a strange time. Some are separated, disconnected. And so, Father, I pray that you would minister to us in a very special way and to our families in this season that we find ourselves in, but that we would not lose the heart of thanksgiving. Um, Father, you have been so good to us. You've been gracious to us your mercy, your love, your, your grace. Uh, Lord, we are thankful, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Thanksgiving, an early Thanksgiving, huh? Come on. And that's when you're supposed to say happy Thanksgiving to me. Okay, you know, come on, this is interactive now. Uh, you know, it is a unique season, and I do hope that... Um, that you find a creative way of just being with family and spending time together, and I hope that uh, you're not alone in this, in this coming week, and that um, and if you're a child of the king, you're not alone. But I, I do trust that there will be creative ways found to minister to one another, for families to gather together, and um, love on each other during this season. And when I think about the message today, and even the message next weekend, I, I, I hope that it will instill in us just a deep thankfulness for being a child of God, and that what, 
And we, when we look towards the end and the end times and we, we, we take a study through Revelation, that it enhances our heart of thankfulness that we are his. He has already won. We win with him and we spend eternity with him forever and ever. And so I hope that as we go through this teaching series, and it is kind of a, 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 an interesting time to go through such a thing, um, that it does increase that heart of gratitude and thankfulness for what God has done for us and what he's going to do for us, okay? So for those of you that might be new and, or watching online that might be your first time, my name is Rick Gearing and I'm lead pastor here at Eastside. And I wanna uh, jump right into Revelation chapter 11 today. So if you have your Bibles, electronic devices, yeah, feel free to turn there with me, Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> so today, we look at the seventh trumpet of God and the second woe, all right? So if you miss the first six trumpets and the first two woes, then I would encourage you to watch or to listen to last week's message, okay? So I won't cover that or do a little summary of that. I'll just encourage you to go and listen to that message. But the seventh trumpet extends from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, to Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. And so it covers a lot of territory, and it ends right before Christ's kingdom is established in chapter 20. So we're, we're getting close to the end, or should I say, the beginning. Is it the end or is it the beginning? Maybe it's both, right? Okay. Someone who, and, I, and I've shared this before, again, if you're new, you're watching and you're uh, your first time, I'm presenting this teaching series from a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view, all right? And so I've talked about that there are different views and that's okay. This is not, there's not dogma in this. We just know that Christ will return. He will establish his eternal kingdom and that should be good, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm, pre but I'm presenting this from that pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view. And so for someone who believes in a post-tribulation rapture, they might believe that this seventh and final trumpet is what Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52, where he said this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, and that's referencing death, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Now, I would say to my friends who hold a post-tribulation view that uh, I, I believe that there's uh, one major problem uh, with believing this trumpet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, that is recorded in Revelation chapter 11. Because this trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15, it is for the gathering of the church, all right? The gathering of the church, not for the final judgment of the ungodly, which is what the seventh trumpet in Revelation chapter 11 is for. And so there is a distinct difference there. You have a trumpet uh, for the gathering of the church, and you have a trumpet, the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, which is uh, judgment, final judgment on the ungodly. Now, when it comes to this seventh trumpet, you will be surprised, believe it or not, that it begins with a praise and worship service, all right? Now look at verse 15 of chapter 11 in the book of Revelation where it says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on, the face, on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Now, time out, all right? Time out there. Where is and who is to come? 
you know, who was and is and is to come. So they sing, they're, they're crying out and they're giving thanks. Who is and who was? Where is who is to come? Well, the coming of the kingdom at this particular time will no longer be futuristic. As we sit here today, we're looking futuristically here that, yes, who is to come, who will come and set up his eternal kingdom. But in this moment of time, it will no longer be futuristic. It will be in the immediate. Notice what it continues to say. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged, a judgment that is reserved for all unbelievers and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So this speaks to the rewarding of Old Testament saints, uh, the raptured church, and tribulation saints. So there will be a judgment and there will be a rewarding going on. And we'll touch base uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of weeks. But we see that, that heaven will erupt into a praise and worship service. It, it's like heaven will chant, we won, we won, we won, you know. We win. And in the midst of all this turmoil and all this tribulation, all this chaos, all this hell invading earth, all this rebellion of mankind, heaven will remind all the inhabitants on earth and in heaven that Christ will, not maybe, but will return. He will set up his and establish his kingdom. And he will, not maybe, but he will reign forever. Amen? And then the second thing we notice in the seventh trumpet is a summary. So it starts with a praise and worship service. And, and then it moves to a summary of all the major players that uh, we find in the tribulation. Major players. And we're told who they will be. The first player is found in chapter 12. You can move there if you'd like. Chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, where it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So, uh, sh long story short here, this is symbolic. This woman is symbolic of Israel. Now, there are three other women who are symbolic in Revelation. Number one, Jezebel, who represents paganism. The scarlet woman, who represents the apostate church. And number three, the wife of the lamb, capital L, lamb. You're like, oh, blasphemy, the wife of the lamb. No, no. Well, the wife of the lamb, who is symbolic and represents the true church. See, the bride of Christ, right? That's, that's us, and our bridegroom, Jesus. We'll get into that, too, in a couple of weeks. Fascinating stuff. Awesome. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. So you have Israel as being, some, uh, being represented here, and Israel agonized. Israel suffered for centuries longing for the Messiah to come and establish and usher in the kingdom of God. Then look at verse 5. She gave birth to a male child, and this is another major player here. And this speaks of Jesus, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And so this symbolizes Christ as king over the nations. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so this speaks to the ascension of Christ that took place 40 days after the resurrection of Christ. And then we see another major player that is found in verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red, red being symbolic of bloodshed, dragon, Who's the dragon? 
Well, the dragon, and this represents Satan, with seven heads, giving us, uh, 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 giving us insight to complete wisdom, seven heads, complete wisdom, ten horns, power, and on his heads, seven diadems, kingly claims. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And so you could say that this is kind of like a flashback to Satan's original rebellion where a third of the angels in heaven who joined in on that rebellion were cast to earth and became demons. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about, who's the woman? The, the woman being Israel who was about to give birth Birth to who? Jesus, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now, Satan has always tried to defeat and destroy Jesus Christ, right? Matthew chapter two tells us that he, tr he used Herod to try and kill Jesus. Matthew chapter four is where he uh, tried to defeat Jesus through temptation, and in Matthew chapter 27, he tried to defeat Jesus by way of crucifixion. And in all these cases, he was unsuccessful, and that will be the case in the tribulation as well. And look, ver and look at verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. So now we're, we're looking ahead here. Now war arose in heaven. Michael, Michael the, the guardian of God's people, the ruler of angels. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. So you could say that we have this epic Star Wars battle going on, all right? And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Believe it or not, Satan and his demonic forces still have access to heaven, all right? They have access to heaven, but they will eventually, right here, be barred forever. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil. Devil means slander, falsely accuse. And Satan, Satan meaning adversary or enemy, the deceiver of the whole world. See, Satan has always tried to deceive. Started in the garden, right? It continues now. He's always tried to deceive, and believe it or not, in the tribulation period, he will successfully deceive the mass. A mass of people he will deceive. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now. This might surprise you, but did you know that Satan has never been in hell? What? True. True statement. He's never been in hell. At the end, he will be, but he hasn't been in hell. And he won't be until after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. No, actually, he spends a lot of his time going back and forth from heaven and earth. Now, here's why, and this is why Paul said this in Ephesians chapter six, listen, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, the question would be, why does Satan go to heaven? Well, look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and by the word of their testimony, their loyalty to Jesus, for they love not their lives even unto death. So Satan, the devil, 
adversary, uh, accuser, slanderer. So Satan, who is our accuser, and because he is, okay, he is our accuser, so because he is, that means that we need a defense attorney, right? If you're going to be accused, then there needs to be a defense. And so we have a defense, we have a defense attorney, and guess who it is? Come on, come on, it's Jesus, right? First John chapter two, verse one. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, as, as, as Christ followers, our goal is not to sin, all right? It's become more and more like Jesus and in his image, and we don't, we are, we don't want to, but there are going to be times maybe we, 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 we fall into sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. So why is Jesus needing to plead our case because there's an accuser, we have this accuser, Satan, who, who, who is approaching God the Father, all right, and, and, and trying to accuse us and, and deem us as useless, unsaved, and unfit. But then Jesus, who is our defense attorney, our advocate, steps in and knows they've been bought with the blood, my blood. They are secure, they are safe. Hey, I mean, tell you, let me tell you, th Thanksgiving is this week. This is something for us as Christ followers to be thankful for, amen? So can I get a shout out this morning, huh? That's a good thing, all right? That, be thankful. Be thankful that you have a, an attorney, an advocate, and his name is Jesus, and he is defending you before our accuser, our, the slanderer, our adversary, the devil and Satan. All right, look at verse 12. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. So it's like there's another praise and worship service that breaks out. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is is short. So Satan will intensify his efforts against God and mankind. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, symbolic of Israel, and Satan will now specifically target her, who had given birth to the male child, who is Jesus. So you have Satan's fury that will come against Israel like never before. Why? Well, however delusional he might be, he still thinks that if he can somehow destroy Israel, he can destroy Jesus. And then in chapter, in chapter 13, we see another player, and that is the Antichrist. Now, we've spent some time on the Antichrist, and again, if you're, if you're new or if you haven't been, uh, been able to connect to this teaching series, then I encourage you to, to go back and get caught up. We spent some time on the Antichrist, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. But the Antichrist, at the three-and-a-half-year mark of the tribulation, will break his peace treaty with Israel and, raid, and wage war against her. And then we move to another player that's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 13, so you can turn there if you'd like. And that other player is the false prophet. And we see the rise of the false prophet in Revelation 13, and look at verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns, so it's inferior to the ten horns of the Antichrist. Like a lamb, low case lamb, L, the false prophet will mimic the true lamb, capital L, Jesus Christ. And so the, this false prophet will be known as the, the greatest religious leader of all time. And it spoke like a dragon. And so, in other words, he will be Satan's mouthpiece. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in, it, in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, 
whose mortal wound was healed. So it's believed by many scholars that at some point that the Antichrist will suffer a blow, a fatal blow, and then will be healed miraculously. And so that will cause people to be astonished of this miracle that takes place and follow the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist will be this political and military leader, and the false prophet will be a religious leader. And he, he, the false prophet, will lead the world to the worship of the Antichrist, which is his ultimate goal. He will bring all religions together, making a one world religion. And he will do signs, wonders, and miracles including making an image on behalf of the Antichrist, and he will have the ability, because again, he's empowered by Satan, he will have the ability to breathe life into this image. And those who don't worship the image uh, will be killed. So there's a lot going on here. As I've said before, what is this, about an eight-week teaching series? And I really probably need eight years, all right? There's a lot going on, and what I hope is happening, it's propelling you to dig in deep yourself in your own time. A lot going on. The, the false prophet will be the Antichrist's greatest cheerleader. He will have a tremendous he will have tremendous supernatural power given to him by Satan that will be used to convince the world that the Antichrist is God. And then the third thing we see in this seventh trumpet is really forward-looking. And this is found in chapter 14, where this chapter is an overview of all that will occur in Revelation chapters 15 through 19. But in this chapter, there are three important announcements that three different angels make. And I, I just want to briefly touch on them. Angel number one, according to verses six through seven, will announce to the entire world that the gospel of Jesus Christ is everlasting. It's, it's like it's one last appeal for people of all nations and tribes and languages to come to Christ. I mean, it's like the angel is making one final announcement of John 3.16, right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so it's like this, this angel number one is making this, this final proclamation of John 3.16. And then angel number two, according to verse eight, will announce that Mystery Babylon, now there's debate on what Mystery Babylon is, okay? But in a nutshell, here is what I believe it to be in that it, it's speaking to the evil system that is set up in the tribulation period controlled by the Antichrist and the false prophet. This evil system set up but that the mystery Babylon will be destroyed and that destruction does take place in Revelation uh, chapter 17 through 18 and then in chapter 19, we see another praise and worship service break out over the destruction of that mystery Babylon. And so angel number two will announce that. And then angel number three, according to verses nine through 11, announced to the world that if one takes the mark of the beast, 666, which is the mark that allows one to buy and sell, and you can read that in uh, the scripture there, it's the mark that allows one to buy and sell, but if one doesn't take that mark, or one that does take that mark, then angel is announcing if you do take that mark, then that person will not be able to escape the wrath of God. A lot of talk about the mark, huh? 
A lot of talk going on around. I mean, when you, when you, when you look at world events right now, I mean, when you and you go through a, a Revelation series, you can see certain things happening, and you can see things intensifying. And you know, again, we're we're not going to put a date and a time on that. We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is we're getting closer, right? I mean, we're we're getting closer. The end, the end is coming. We just don't know when it is, but we can see it intensifying. We can see a lot of these things playing out. We can see, as I said last week, when, when uh, the two, the two uh, prophets are dead, like the whole world sees them. Well, 50 years ago, we would have been like, how's that possible? Today we know. It's, it's through a phone. It's through my phone, right? I can show that. And so... Um, and, and, and so when you, when you consider the mark of the beast and how easily that could be done as well, and I, I'm not a, I don't like to get into conspiracies and things like that, I'm, I, I don't wanna go there, but you can just see, even with chips, right, microchips, how something like that could be done. Like if you don't have a certain, a certain this, you can't buy or sell. So, you see it. You can see it happening. You can see that we're getting there. Very interesting stuff. So chapter 14 concludes with the overview of the coming battle of Armageddon. There's been a lot of talk about that battle, and we'll talk briefly about it uh, soon. But the battle of Armageddon where God's wrath, man's fury or the rebellion of man and Satan's fury come together all at the same time in an epic battle. And at the end of this battle, Scripture tells us that blood will flow 200 miles at four, four and a half feet deep. It's incomprehensible. And then the last thing we see take place in the seventh trumpet is the seven bowls of wrath and we see these seven bowls in chapters 15 and 16, and it's here that we're at the very end. Things have, they continue to intensify. We go through the first six trumpets, the first two woes, we're in the seventh trumpet, the third woe, we're right at the very end, and these seven bowls of wrath will be plagues that will be poured out on earth by seven different angels. And those plagues, are painful, nasty sores, as you can see in chapter 16, verse 2. They are another angel or the bowl, a bowl of wrath will be oceans that become blood and everything dies. Rivers and springs that become blood in verse 4 of chapter 16. Earth, including people, will be scorched by the sun in chapter 16, verse 8 through 9. The next plague will be worldwide darkness and pain in chapter 16, verse 10 through 11. The next plague will be the Euphrates River being dried up, which will make way for that battle to take place in Armageddon in chapter 16, verse 12 through 16. And then the last one will be an earthquake unlike the world has ever seen. And that's in chapter 16, verse 17 through 21. It says that Jerusalem will be split into three parts. It says that cities and nations will fall, mountains and islands will disappear, 100 pound hailstones will fall from the sky. And so it's this plague, this plague will end with the seventh angel making a proclamation. Anybody know what that proclamation will be? It is finished. That's what it will, that's the seventh angel proclamation. It is finished. Now, it's interesting because it, this final bowl of wrath, or this final bowl of, yeah, the earthquake and uh, hell, hell stones and all, and then the proclamation, it's very, it, it's interesting because it parallels uh, Christ's death on a cross. His final breath on the cross was what? It is finished. The earth shook, and then the veil in the temple was torn in two. Some similarities there. It is finished. So the world is in utter ruin, 
And as hard as it is to imagine, I mean, it's hard to imagine all, all this taking place, but as hard as it is to imagine, people will still be shaking their fists at God, cursing him, and refusing to repent. I think that's even, I think that's more challenging for me to believe than any of the other stuff. That through all of this, that people will still curse God and refuse to repent. We'll pick it up next week in chapter 19. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to close <clears throat> with this question. How is this teaching series changing your heart, changing your mind, uh, changing your perspective? If it's not changing, then, then why? Is it, is it bad preaching? Is it bad listening? Is it bad gas? I mean, what, what is it, okay? My prayer for this teaching series is that it would change us by giving us a deep passion for the lost, those who don't know Christ that it would give us a deep passion to share our faith, a deep passion to invite people to church in person or online. Passion to know God better, passion to know others better, passion to serve God and go on mission. See, when we have a correct view of eschatology, that is the study of end times, it will change our attitude towards Christ, his church, and his mission. When we have a correct view, we understand why we do the things that we do as a church. Reach, teach, make disciples. See, when we have a correct view of eschatology, we understand that we can't allow, ourselves, we can't allow in our lives and in this church for the great commission to become the great omission. And I'm afraid that's what's happened in a lot of churches and in a lot of Christians around the world. Has it happened in your life? Something that I've already had to deal with in my own and has it happened in your life? It may it not be said that it would happen in this church that the Great Commission become the Great Omission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always. I am with you always. Say that with me. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This passion in my heart 
this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know I'm living for your glory on the earth for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me this passion in my heart this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow Jesus, the name. 
Calvary Church. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated. As we finish up today, I just want to be an encouragement to you. You may look at the world around you and go, man, this is tough. But when you're in a sermon series like this, you can recognize it could get tougher. <laughs> but the one thing that holds it all together is Jesus. The one thing that keeps it moving in the right direction is Jesus. And today you may not know that Jesus, or you may want to know more about him. Maybe you want to know more how, how to live a life that reflects him or to have a relationship with him. And I would encourage you to text next steps to the number that's on the screen or in your chat box. And here's why. Because it's going to initiate a conversation. There's absolutely nothing that anybody can say from this stage that's going to save you. I don't need to say that again. There's nothing that anybody from this stage can say that will save you. It begins a conversation that you have, God. Sometimes it's good to be walked through that. Sometimes it's good to be encouraged. So you say, Matt, I want to know what it means to be more involved at Eastside. I'd like to be a member here. I, I think I've heard some stuff and I'd like to be baptized. Same thing. Just send it to next steps. And then make sure as you text that to that number, know that you're going to get a response coming back real quickly. We want you to know as a church, we're thankful for you. Extremely thankful for you. And so as you go through this week, know that we'll be lifting you up, knowing that we're going to be excited about the mission that God has called us to as we continue forward with what God is doing, not only in Eastside, but beyond as we transform Fort Smith and beyond with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our safety team is gonna be dismissing us soon, and so stay seated until they get you here in-house, and then for those of you online, we'll see you next week.